All right, we are now joined by Ross Barkin. He is a Jacobin columnist based in New York and the author of the book, The Prince, Andrew Cuomo, Coronavirus and the Fall of New York. We're gonna be talking to Ross about his recent piece in the new issue of Jacobin, which is titled Working Class Politics Without the Working Class and is about the Working Families Party. So Ross, first of all, good to see you. Good to be back. Very excited to talk WFP. Indeed. Uh, so let's just dive in. Um, I think we should start by just sort of laying out what exactly the Working Families Party is. Uh, I, I assume that a lot of viewers probably have a general idea of them as kind of a you know force in progressive politics, particularly in New York, but in a couple of other states as well. Um, but in particular, can you just sort of give a brief overview of how their fusion voting strategy worked and then also, like how they formed alliances with labor unions in order to become this force in progressive politics in New York. Sure. So the Working Families Party is a left wing or progressive third party that was formed in New York in 1998 and now exists throughout the country. Uh, but New York has always been a power base for WFP in part because it employs, as you said, a strategy or it takes advantage of something you're allowed to do in New York called fusion voting. So New York is one of the few states in America, very few, where a political candidate can run on multiple party ballots at once. So in New York state, you can run as a Democrat and a Republican at the same time. You can run as Democrat and Green Party, though the Green Party does not cross indoors. Um, you can also, there used to be a lot more third parties in New York that were not uh, so prominent, but we're really there to hand off votes to, to certain parties. You know, you can run as like Democrat and Independence Party or something like that. So we've always had fusion voting in New York. It dates back a very long time. And what WFP does to avoid the spoiler effect, they're a third party, but they always will cross endorse Democrats. It's very, very rare for a candidate to run only on the third party WFP ballot line. Now, the WFP came into existence uh, very well intentioned to push the Democratic Party to the left. Now, this was the 1990s. The Democratic Party obviously was much more fiscally conservative than it is today, socially conservative as well. And it really was this idea that in New York, the Democratic Party had lost touch with its working class base. Labor unions were very involved in the foundation of WFP and played a very big role that would change in the 2010s, but um, at its foundation, it was this sort of labor plus activist party, progressive activists and organized labor coming together to push the Democratic Party slowly leftward. And that was the strategy. And in many ways, it was uh, successful. Yeah, so uh, let's let's then dive into the meat of your article because you sort of track the evolution of this strategy and of the Working Families Party over the last, I guess, two, two three decades. So um, something you wrote in your article, which I thought was really interesting, is you say the Working Families Party in recent years has paradoxically become both stronger and weaker than it once was. Unspool that a little bit. What do you mean by this? So a very interesting thing happened in the 2010s. You know, New York elects Andrew Cuomo, a conservative Democrat, to say the least, as governor. He is very hostile to the progressive movement broadly. He initially is very hostile to organized labor as well, though that would change over time. And uh, one of the things Andrew Cuomo was committed to doing, really from when he first came into office in 2011, was to effectively destroy the Working Families Party. Now, the WFP uh, was not powerful enough to defeat Andrew Cuomo, but it certainly was there to call him out for his various policy choices and you know to run candidates in the city council or state legislature that he didn't like. And so really in 2014, he uh, came to um, a lot of the big labor unions in the state and gave them an ultimatum. It's either me or WFP. And at the time, um, you had a lot of these sort of institutional aligned labor unions who both were friendly at WFP, but needed to be on good terms with Andrew Cuomo because the governor in New York is incredibly powerful. If you're a public sector union, you bargain with him. And if you're a private sector union, you often depend on the business of the state. So yeah. it, it, Cuomo said, you know, you're going you're gonna to choose me or you're going to choose WFP. Many of the big labor unions chose him. And this rupture happened 
around 2014 and then continued on a few years later, where unions slowly exited the Working Families Party. And on one hand, that allowed the Working Families Party to take more unabashedly progressive positions. The unions were more of a sort of like moderating influence in the sense that since they had their members to worry about or they had, uh, you know, uh, had to do collective bargaining, they didn't want to alienate uh, politicians in power. So the WFP would do things like not always endorse the most progressive candidate. They supported Cuomo in 2014, even yeah, after yeah. all of this, which was very controversial because Zephyr Teachout was running against him. Right. So the WFP itself was caught between two worlds of like its activist base and labor, which never wanted to go that far left, right? So in one sense, labor leaving was sort of purifying for WFP in one sense, in one way, in the other way, though, it was a loss of real ground troops. It, it kind of was the beginning of, I would say, the Working Families Party detaching from its um, labor base yeah. um, and trying to figure out what would what it would be, right? In 2016, WFP went all in on Bernie Sanders, and it was very clear they're going to be kind of this, you know, unabashedly progressive, maybe quasi-socialist without calling themselves Socialist Party. And an interesting thing I think happened later on, which I write about too, is around sort of 2018, 2019, 2020, WFP isn't quite sure where to go in the sense that you have the rise of the socialist left and you have kind of this like liberal left, sort of more identity based left. And this really came to a head with Warren versus Bernie, where WFP, I'd argue, made a very bad decision to support Elizabeth Warren over Bernie Sanders. And that also um, created yet another kind of rift between uh, its activist base, where you had sort of socialist and left line activists going with Bernie. And then you have kind of these sort of maybe more NGO types or nonprofit types going with Warren. Um, and I would say today the WFP in one hand is, is strong because they have a great brand. They're nationally known. They have a very effective fundraising list. Um, they, are, they are able to genuinely raise money for candidates. Mm -hmm. But I've argued over and over again, and they hate this. But I keep doing it because I think it's true. They function today effectively as a super PAC that helps pay for staff and coordinates with candidates. And this is very important. Why does WFP want a ballot line in New York so badly? When you are a political party in New York, you can coordinate directly with your endorsed candidate. So a super PAC, as we all know, you can spend all the money you want. You can't legally coordinate the campaign. WFP kind of gets the best of both worlds. They get to function, I say effectively as a super PAC, spend, do IE, spend tons of money, but still hire staff for a campaign, still give strategy, right? So I think it's still, it's effective in a way, but it's not a classic political party. Mm -hmm. And I also think it does have a problem where it's not necessarily in touch with like a working class, like black or Latino base or a white working class base. And some of his, its endorsement decisions in the last few years, I would say have been questionable. Yeah, let's let's talk about those endorsements for a second, because um, I guess the first question is, how important are they really? Right. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, you know, they endorse Warren, who did not move very far in the primaries at all. Um, you mentioned that, you know, they you 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 know have some questions about some recent endorsements maybe go into those a little bit and then talk about like what they what they tell us about the trajectory of the WFP and its base right now so I, I write a lot about WFP and DSA as well and like one of the huge differences between DSA and WFP is that DSA is very uh, strategic and very, some would say parsimonious, I, I, I think savvy as well in who they endorse. DSA, mm -hmm. certainly New York, I can say, can't speak as much to other states, but in New York runs a very small slate. Even now for the state legislature, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head, they're only endorsing a handful of assembly and state Senate candidates, not many, under 10. Yeah. Um, yeah. WFP in every single cycle will endorse tons of candidates. I mean, they will run out a huge slate it's almost like you know handing out candy you get a WFP endorsement. So what does a WFP endorsement matter, right? If they are investing in your race, it can matter. Mm -hmm. Often it's a paper endorsement. Often it's just like, oh, you know, you may or may not have the ballot line. Again, the ballot line doesn't matter a ton for getting votes. There aren't that many quote WFP voters in actuality. In mat the ballot line, like I said, matters to them because they get to function like a super PAC but still coordinate with candidates. 
So I, I think in certain races, they matter. I give the example of, of the Queens District Attorney's race in 2019, where Tiffany Caban ran against the institutional candidate Melinda Katz. And Tiffany Caban, as a leftist insurgent, nearly won. And she nearly won in part because WFP was able to pump a lot of money into her campaign, hire staff, and provide sort of you know strategic advice since they do have you know traditional kind of uh, you know base of political operatives. So that was good and that was helpful and that was a nice DSA WFP synergy. Now DSA has the volunteers. There aren't really a lot of WFP volunteers. Mm -hmm. They have activist groups they work with. They're kind of an umbrella organization for various NGOs. But there aren't like there's not like an army of WFP people waiting to go knock on doors. They pretend there is. I don't think there really is. DSA has the army, but DSA isn't like a super PAC and they don't necessarily have like a, a national fundraising list they can easily tap into. Though they've gotten much better at fundraising. But in terms of endorsements, yeah, I mean the Warren endorsement was a total disaster. Um, did not hurt WFP from a PR sense. I think WFP has been very good at their kind of media strategy game where DSA and kind of the mainstream press get, will get hammered if they lose a race and you'll get like right, the right. think pieces is socialism over in America because <laughs> like some city council candidate lost, right? right? Whereas WFP can kind of take it on the chin a lot and they kind of breeze right forward. I mean, the, the Warren, as, as we know, we don't have to talk ad nauseum, but I mean, she not win a single state, yeah. did not come anywhere close, hung out, hung out in the race way too long uh, into Super Tuesday and really beyond sort of like this white, professional class could not galvanize anyone. Um, and that that was WFP's like sort of prize campaign of the cycle. So nationally, they failed miserably on that front. Um, they've had a lot of successes down the ballot as well. And, um, you know, then they've elected, you know, helped elect like a lot of city council candidates and state legislative candidates. They get involved in other states too, states without fusion voting. So They've got a lot of value. They also make curious choices. You know, I, I the Pennsylvania Senate primary is a big one here, where John Fetterman is clearly ahead. He is a fairly progressive candidate, a populist. You have Connor Lamb, who's like the moderate, right. and then Malcolm right. Kenyatta, who's like sort of this like anti-Bernie uh, identity progressive, who WFP for some reason has endorsed, and he has really no chance of winning. Like he's pulling way behind. He like over and over again throughout 2016 and 2020 was just pounding away at Bernie Sanders, you know, mm -hmm. on these sort of uh, identity or like Russia DNC talking point kind of based grounds. I mean, it, it, he's not really he's not really a candidate that like a, a national political party should be supporting. Right. I would say also if they had their working class base, their labor base, I don't think labor unions would be supporting him either. So for mm -hmm. me. The, the Kenyatta endorsement was was kind of an example of uh, both an endorsement that like a DSA type party wouldn't do, but then like the old WFP, which was very labor oriented, they would look at this race and probably just support Fetterman because he's the front runner. And that's what labor does. So that, that endorsement to me is interesting and I think is a misfire in the sense that he's not going to win. And if polls are correct, he will probably finish third or worse. Right. So I guess that raises the question, like, do you see any path for the WFP to kind of revive its labor base um, and become an effective vehicle for working class politics in New York, in Pennsylvania, any, in any state? I, I think there's a path. I mean, I mean, I think this is a challenge for DSA, too. I think all left leftist endeavors today um, have this challenge of kind of being able to merge with labor. Also labor, you know, depending on the state is not very strong. New York is unique yeah. where New York does have a history and still kind of a, um, a base of politically powerful labor. One challenge for WFP and for DSA is labor tends to side with incumbents. Labor is generally pro status quo. There's always been this tension. This is nothing new. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's hard. I, I think on one hand, it's hard to do good progressive politics or left politics and be closely aligned with labor where either in certain states, labor just is weak, or in the case of New York, you have a mix of labor, right? You have like very kind of genuine progressive labor unions that really are on, I'd say the good fights. Most of the time you have labor unions that in New York supported Republicans for years, 1199, the healthcare workers union. Strong, strongest union in the state, massive union, tons of money. This union through 2016 was bankrolling Republicans in the state Senate. So that's a challenge too. 
I think for DSA and for WFP, um, I'd argue more for WFP because they don't even do a lot of, I would say, as much on the ground work um, in, in terms of like getting volunteers together, doing classic party building. You know, for WFP, it's like getting getting in touch with that working class base. I think, I think you, I think I've seen with WFP um, again this like very uh, overtly kind of um, focus on you know, lingo employed by highly educated activists. You know, I've, I've seen kind of this, you know, again, this warn, warnification of kind of themselves, which has continued on post-2019, where it often feels like they're appealing more to online activists mm -hmm. than to actual working class people who maybe have more moderate views on, on certain issues. So I do think they need to think more strategically and, and more humbly too about, being a, a working class party, right? Maybe you can't be a labor party because labor is going to do what labor is going to do, but being a working class party. And for DSA too, that, that, that's a central cha challenge to not merely be a party that succeeds in kind of more younger or highly educated milieus, but to really branch out and do well in a lot of different environments. Um, but I think DSA is a bit more earnest about the party building aspect. Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know. I think for, for me, at least what I see, WFP is functioning a bit too much like this online fundraising list and super PAC and less like the uh, party that is trying to party build in different right. places. Yeah. So maybe let's wrap up on this question of party building, right? Because, uh, you know, we're obviously a long way off from seeing a left labor party or, you know, let alone a socialist party in the U.S. Uh, but the, the topic does kind of come up from time to time. What would that look like? How do we begin to build it? And I think that the analogy that is often invoked is the Tea Party, right? Like some people are like, well, could we use a kind of Tea Party strategy to take over the Democratic Party? Um, we don't actually hear a lot about the Working Families Party, I don't think, when the question of party comes up. So maybe, you know, I mean, you've already hinted at this, but is this a viable model? Is their model a viable model? Um, and, and if not, you know, what exactly does a kind of left working class labor party need? I think it, it, it's not a viable model in the sense that you're, you're not going to get like a new party out of it. I think WFP's value is that it, it's a it's a organization that exists to assist when possible progressive candidates in some tough races. And They've got money to do it. And they've got manpower to do it. And that's a value. Are they building a political party? Not really. I am not sanguine on third parties in the US. I, I yeah. think we've seen a kind of a long history of third parties getting crushed by the two main parties, being unable to compete in a, in a first past the post system. Right. Um, so I, 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 I believe the DSA strategy of, of co-opting the Democratic Party line makes a lot of sense. And in New York, they've had real success in electing socialists to the state legislature and now to the city council who are genuine in their convictions, but happen to run and win as Democrats. And they do work with the party, but they also function as their own voting block in the state legislature. So I think the most viable thing is probably a version of that Tea Party strategy where you just keep electing more socialist or left-wing candidates to office throughout America. I think state legislatures in general are fertile ground for this. These are low turnout races. They're not expensive races. You go outside of New York to get even less expensive. There's this, been this big obsession with the presidency, rightfully so. The Bernie campaign is very important, but I think what we've seen is you're only going to get so far with the president, but you can do a lot if you control legislature. You can do a lot if you control governor's mansion. I always use an example of Wisconsin, which, you know, tragically was once a very progressive state, a working class sort of democratic state, and now has swung right. And for eight years was run by like an unabashedly right wing governor who is very kind of out of touch. I'd say with a lot of voters in the state, but managed to win and implement a far right agenda. And that's yeah. Scott Walker, of course. So I, I always say this, like the left needs to find its own Scott Walker, like find someone who can come in and govern as an unabashed leftist and do big things in a short amount of time. He crushed organized labor in Wisconsin rather quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Easier said than done for, for the left to do the reverse. But I do think thinking on the state level is very important. It's where the right wing has been for a long time. The left wing really has to get there. I do think DSA is working on that, certainly number of states, and, and that work will have to continue. 
All right. So again, Ross's article in the new issue of Jacobin is Working Class Politics Without the Working Class. I encourage you to check it out. We will link it in the description box below. Ross, thank you so much for your time. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you for having me. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks. Thanks.